Coming up on episode 10 of Omnivore, the art and science of being a flavorist, formulating gluten-free bread without bitterness, and 30 years later, the legacy of the Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak. This is Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT First, annual event and expo. Join science and food professionals from around the globe, July 16th through the 19th in Chicago. Go to iftevent.org to learn more. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology Magazine, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm your host, Bill McDowell. Ever marvel how your favorite snack brand was able to capture the taste of a dill pickle and a potato chip? Or how a plant-based fish fillet can actually taste like fresh cod? Flavorists are the unsung wizards concocting new foods and beverages with a combination of chemistry and artistry. Food Technologies Deputy Managing Editor Kelly Hensel recently spoke with Marie Wright, Chief Global Flavorist and President of Creation, Design, and Development at ADM, about how she got her start as a flavorist, some projects she's most proud of, and what she hopes to be doing in the next decade. My first question is just kind of to get your background, what made you decide to become a flavorist? Um, so <laughs> I'd always had a, a, a deep interest in food, flavor, I mean, I grew up with a um, multicultural uh, family, so was exposed to herbs and different types of cuisine, Italian, Turkish, so, um, and spending summers in France. So very exposed to, to food, flavor, and, you know, also I had a love of science. So, you know, that combination of, of love for culinary, and a love for science and chemistry, um, you know, obviously I studied chemistry and, and then food science and, and that kind of culminated into a decision to to really um, play a role, if you like, in the food industry. You know, when, when I got the invitation from you, it was an opportunity to look back and, you know, think about, you know, the, my career and whether I ended up doing what I intended to do. Right. Because you don't always end yeah, up what you intend true. to do. And um you know, it's it's pretty cool, the opportunity now more than ever to have an impact, I think. So uh, scientists, you know, you know, around the world, we want to attract more people into the food industry. Mm -hmm. um, we're not attracting enough people. We need to get out there and influence and, and you know, be an influencer to bring For people sure. into the industry. Um, so and, and flavor, the flavorist role is certainly an, an interesting role, an interesting career to career path to take. So I always found the flavors job so interesting, especially just because of the amount of training that you guys have to do to become a flavorist. It's definitely a mentoring profession. Mm -hmm. So um, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to um, start the Academy of Future Flavorists at ADM a number of years ago now. So we're on to our fourth set of trainees, mm -hmm. if would you believe. Um, and it, it really is a combination of mentoring under um, senior flavorist, principal, chief flavorist, as well as a formal program, because some of it's very, you know, academic and, and you've got to learn it, basically. And then the other part of it is is learning the craft and you can only learn the craft by by doing it. Um, and, you know, we tend to rotate people so they don't become a mini you know, nobody wants to be a mini Marie or a mini whoever, you know, you want people to develop their own skill set. But it is, you know, it's a long process. You know, I always say to people, um, you know, if you ever have a piece of food, anything, candy, drink, block your nose, drink it, unblock, and then you get what I call the magic whoosh of, of flavor. And your brain is instantly, you know, taking this complex mix of molecules and identifying it as strawberry, orange, whatever it is. And as a flavorist, we're learning to kind of reverse the process, if you like, break it down and figure out what we should mix together, um, you know, to make something that's great and, and, and tasty. And nowadays, of course, we're we're focused on natural and good for you. So we're using lots of different natural extracts, ingredients, preparations to, to get that result. So Marie, this is probably an impossible question for you to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. 
if there is one flavor or project or maybe even an endeavor that you've had during your career um, that you're especially proud of, what would it be? All right, I'm, I'm going to pick two. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Just because um, I, I was thinking about this the other day because I'm putting a lecture together uh, for the Bill Littlejohn Award, oh, yeah. which I'm getting in May, which I'm oh, super nice. excited about. Congratulations. And, and I was thinking about that first time that um, – I suddenly realized I could do the job Mm. because for many years you're training, you think, Oh, I can't, I really can't do this. It's a total, total mess. Um, (laughs) Not really create from scratch. And I created a pate flavor. Would you believe? Okay. Um, And so, and it was so authentic and I sold it. So I was like on cloud nine. So that was kind of the realization that, okay, I know how to do this and it's magic and it's exciting. Yeah. And then, you know, more recently, you know, I I I'm I think it's incredible. I I don't think like 5 years ago we would have imagined that you could create a piece of fish from, you know, soy protein or right. pea protein or whatever protein we're using, plant protein essentially, mm-hmm. and it look and taste and feel like fish. So, um I'm not part of that creating the the product I'm but I'm I created the the taste of this cod flavor and just amazed at how universal it was and how amazing this fish tasted like real fish in fact probably better than um so that's kind of exciting because I think I would never have imagined that we would be doing things like this it's it's insane (laughs) what we're capable of doing and um which is yeah. great because we need more protein for the world. Right. Um, we need it to taste good. Um, mm-hmm. So that essentially is, you know, two, I mean, I guess they were both savory, but those are two examples. Where, where do you see your career in the next five to 10 years going? Are you just hoping to do more of what you're doing now? Is there some, some area that you'd like to expand? But I, I really want to stay in more in the innovation space mm-hmm. um, and driving more innovation Um and really focusing on, you know, driving innovation to have sustainable solutions right across the food and beverage category. Food and beverage is it's obviously my, my kind of core and, and, yeah. and passion. Um, so, you know, whether that's, you know, in the long term, I hope it's with ADM. Um, then I hope we do more of, of uh, our ventures. We, we do a lot of investments in new companies and I can get more involved and excited about some of the things that the bringing new new innovations and, and new ways of working. Mm-hmm. And I'm very excited about AI. And that's an area that, um, you know, I, I personally would like to see play more of a role in mm-hmm. formulation. Marie Wright, Chief Global Flavorist and President of Creation, Design and Development at ADM, has created more than 2,500 flavors during her three-decade career for a range of food and beverage categories, including sweet, savory, pet food, and animal nutrition. Learn more about Marie and four other food system change makers profiled in the April issue of Food Technology. At IFT First annual event and expo this July, attendees will experience innovation in action, research, scientific discoveries, and connect with peers new and old. The theme of this year's IFT First is innovation in a time of crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Attendee registration is now open. Register today at iftevent.org. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Gluten-free bread products are winning over consumers, including those who do not have gluten sensitivity or aren't celiac positive. Yet, making a bread without gluten that has all the favored sensory properties, nutritional benefits, and structure that consumers prefer is challenging. Researchers with the USDA's Agricultural Research Services Center for Grain and Animal Health Research wanted to see if they could make a sorghum-based, gluten-free bread that could meet sensory quality expectations. Food Technology Associate Editor Emily Little spoke with researchers Ryan Arduin and Brennan Smith about what they learned that could take gluten-free bread to the next level. Ryan and Brennan, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be here. 
So let's start off with a bit of basics when it comes to this research. What exactly is sorghum bran? So sorghum bran is a byproduct of sorghum, I guess, processing for application into breads and other products of sorghum flour. The bran itself is comprised of the outer layers of the grain, and that's where all the fiber, the phytonutrient, or most of the fiber, phytonutrients, and um, a lot of the vitamins are located. So why did you feel it was important to use this byproduct within your research? The byproduct itself, what we were targeting with this one was gluten-free breads are typically very starch rich and have are very limited in the micronutrients. Historically, when we try to add fiber and some of the other stuff back in, it really decreases quality. Gluten-free breads are always on the borderline of failing in terms of quality, literal failure at least in collapsing in the oven during baking. And so this is a very difficult process to do and be successful in. And the goal was to put those nutrients back into bread. And we used a tannin containing sorghum bran, which is not normal for sorghum. So tannin has been bred out of sorghum for the grain sorghum that's sold in the United States. So this is very much kind of a niche variety of sorghum that we used. So getting into the nitty gritty, how exactly did you get the sorghum bran into the gluten-free bread? What was the baking process like? Uh, the, the baking process started with an existing gluten-free bread formulation uh, that Brennan and our colleagues who were also included on this research uh, from one of our units in Manhattan, Kansas, had developed. And so it contains sorghum flour, but without the bran or, or without the tannin containing bran that we added into it. We used what was called a response surface design to vary the amount of sorghum bran that was incorporated into the formulation. And we wanted to do that by maximizing the loaf's specific volume and its softness or reducing hardness, put differently. And also to maximize the number of cells, air cells in the bread per square inch, and to decrease the thickness of the cell walls. So we use that response surface design, vary the amount of the ingredient, the key ingredient here, sorghum bran, along with water and a, and a gum. And we looked for the formulation uh, that gave us the most desirable quality ba based on those four things that we measured. And that design uh, kind of spits out this predicted optimum formulation for us. And what exactly were those results of those four qualities you measured for? Well, speaking from um, a, a quality standpoint and from a sensory standpoint, um, it basically matched what was there in the control bread without the brand addition. So we, we were able to put a little over 14% of that tannin containing sorghum bran back into the bread and achieve the same quality that we got from the control bread, which didn't have the added benefits of antioxidant capacity and added fiber. And that's an awful lot of bran to be putting in bread. I mean, 14% is a lot. Right. So. <laughs> Well, that's great. I remember when reading the Science Forward piece that there was an aspect of this about bitterness. What was that measurement process like? So one of the concerns with putting things like tannins in foods is that they can be perceived as bitter. They're notorious for that. And so uh, we thought that that might be or generally is a limiting factor in, in how much tannins you can put in a food product like bread that people don't want to be bitter. And what we found is that at the levels that we were able to use in the bread, there was no difference in perceived bitterness. And we measured that through a consumer panel of 100 people. Oh, and wow. we asked them to rate the bitterness intensity. And there was no difference between the control bread and the bread that had the tannin containing sorghum bran. I was speaking to a colleague recently about how people don't want something better necessarily. They want the same. And it seems like you achieved that with this consumer panel. Yes, that, that was the goal. Mm -hmm. So looking ahead, what are the next steps in terms of this research? So our research unit here is we're not really tasked with working with sorghum. 
but we had this commercially available product that we were able to use as kind of a stepping stone in a model system to do what we want to do. Our particular research unit is tasked with rice research and rice utilization. And so rice bran is a byproduct of rice production that they're always trying to find uses for. And so the next step in this process is doing something similar, but with rice bran. Um, not just the regular brown rices, but some of the niche varieties like the reds and the purples and that sort of thing. And it, really, for that matter, not even just gluten-free breads, but wheat breads as well, possibly tortillas, things of that nature. And Ryan also has some research going on with beverages. We do. So uh, like Brennan said, similar to sorghum rice generally gets milled during processing. It takes off that bran layer. It's a, it's a lower value byproduct or co-product, but it's also got some uh, health beneficial compounds in it. It just so happens that with the sorghum bran we used, it were the tannins that we were interested in. With this rice bran that we're working with, it's anthocyanins generally that we're interested in, but also going to have some good antioxidant properties, also going to lend some interesting colors to the products. And in, in that same vein, trying to find uses of that to put them back into the food supply. Upcycling is such a huge trend right now, and it seems to be the same with your research teams. That That is absolutely, yes, one, one of our goals, uh, both that we have in common here with our rice research and our collaborators out in Manhattan, Kansas with their sorghum research is, is that upcycling and valorization. Yeah, we're trying to ensure, I guess, the sustainability of U.S. agriculture by promoting the commodities themselves and finding ways to add value whether that be through different product streams or the commodity themselves. Well, fantastic. Ryan, Brennan, thank you so much for explaining your research and good luck with your future steps. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. Ryan Ardowan is a research food technologist and sensory scientist with the Agricultural Research Service. Brennan Smith is a supervisory research scientist also with ARS. You can read more about their research of sorghum-based bread in the April issue of Food Technology, as well as the January 2023 issue of the Journal of Food Science. Twenty twenty-three marks the 30th anniversary of the Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak, which sickened more than 700 people and killed four children. As a lead investigator at USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service, Anne-Marie McNamara was at ground zero during the crisis, which caught many food professionals by surprise. Ultimately, McNamara would go on to co-author groundbreaking national food safety regulations and programs, including USDA's Pathogen Reduction HACCP Rule, FDA's Healthy People 2012, in President Bill Clinton's Food Safety Initiative. Food Technologies' Julie Larson Brisher caught up with a pioneering microbiologist and food safety champion to talk about the legacy of the -the jack-in-the-box crisis and its impact on the future of food safety. Hi, Anne-Marie. I'm glad we could catch up today and talk more about how food safety has evolved over the past three decades. I am too, Julie, so thank you for the invitation. I am honored to be able to share my thoughts on the evolution of food safety with the IFT community. Well, that's great. Well, let's dive right in then, because I'm so sure that we could easily go over the segment time constraint here. (laughs) Um, In your dialogue essay, you gave us a succinct rundown of the state of food safety when that jack-in-the-box outbreak occurred 30 years ago. And I think you summed it up aptly when you wrote, the nation was shocked that a hamburger could kill. Can you set the stage for us again today and why so shocking? To understand the impact of the outbreak, we must revisit the 1980s. I call the 1980s the decade of food chemistry. At the time, chemical pesticides were the focus of consumer advocacy. The only food testing program codified into law at USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service was the Chemical Residues Regulatory Program. FSIS leadership was primarily veterinarians. Salmonella species, E. coli 015787, 
and Listeria monocytogenes were recognized as human pathogens, but were considered natural flora in raw meat and poultry. And so there were no pathogen testing requirements in raw meat. In 1982, two small outbreaks of 0157 from undercooked hamburgers occurred at McDonald's restaurants. These were the first occurrences of 0157 linked to beef products. FSIS microbiologists developed new methods to detect this new pathogen. The CDC was battling AIDS at the time. Industry had none of the food safety interventions familiar today, nor teams of professionals focused on food safety. If any interventions were used, they were for shelf life extensions. Total quality management was the focus and teams were called quality assurance. CDC alerted FSIS in January 1993 that an outbreak of 017 was occurring linked to jack-of-the-box restaurants. The nation was shocked that a hamburger could kill. It was common practices for families to frequent fast food restaurants as a family treat. Often families frequented a fast food restaurant on a weekly basis. Imagine being a parent and learning that four children died and over four, 700 people were ill from eating a hamburger that you believed would be safe to eat. In addition, many developed hemolytic uremic syndrome, a serious life-changing disease that permanently disabled them. Parents wondered what other foods might not be safe and what went wrong. Were their family members at risk? It seems like a lot accelerated after that um, outbreak in terms of regulation and industry approaches to food safety. And what, what major changes did you personally see happen? Well, this outbreak incurred regulatory and industry change that accelerated food safety throughout the 1990s and even beyond. The outbreak was a crisis that became an opportunity to advance the policy and practice of food safety and shifted the focus from chemical residues to the control of microbial pathogens. As Director of Microbiology at FSIS, I was involved in investigating this outbreak. I co-authored the congressionally funded War on Pathogens program and initiated 30 pathogen research projects, the baseline studies of pathogens and indicator bacteria on meat and poultry products, and gained FSIS research grant authority to speed the development of pathogen detect detection methods. The FSIS administrator, Mike Taylor, took on the legal challenge of making 0157 the first pathogenic adulterant in raw ground beef based on the fact that consumers did not cook ground beef to temperatures that kill 0157 and also on the severity of the disease. HACCP, the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points Program, was studied by the National Advisory Committee for Microbial Criteria in Foods. Ultimately, FSIS published the Pathogen Reduction HACCP Rule in 1996, which changed regulations from reactive organoleptic inspection of meat and poultry to proactively evaluating and controlling foodborne risks and mandating microbial testing for the very first time. Outside of FSIS, food safety advances were made on a myriad of other fronts. Dave Thino, who became vice president of food safety at Jack of the Box following the outbreak, developed a restaurant food safety program, including microbial testing, cook time validation, employee training, and restaurant HACCP. CDC developed the Sentinel site, FoodNet, and PulseNet programs to identify foodborne disease. FDA developed the Food Code, a series of restaurant practices to serve safe food. Declaring 0157 an adulterant required industry to develop new pathogen interventions. Academia and industry researched and developed antimicrobial interventions, carcass steam and hot water treatments, and steam vacuums. In the 2000s, food safety departments, food safety professionals, and food safety cultures were born. So, Emory, you have so much experience advocating for science-based food safety in government and industry settings. And here we're talking about Jack in the Box. So, for example, 
you actually took over the lead on food safety from Dave Fino um, when he retired at Jack in the Box. So it's it's kind of interesting to talk to you. You have a great, almost a circular perspective on what's going on here. And I, I would really be remiss if I didn't ask you, what's next? You know, what do you think are the most important next steps in strengthening our food safety outcomes? And do they involve more mindset or technology? Well, Julie, I believe it's critical for industry and government to share and review the details of every food safety outbreak, not only to learn from past mistakes, but to prevent future cases of illness. Progress in food safety science, technology, and policy must continue. And you're right, Julie, progress will involve both a mindset of food safety as well as new technological advances. New food safety challenges include antimicrobial resistance of pathogens, global disease transmission, which threatens food production and animal and human health. Climate change threatens food security, which encourages laboratory-derived foods and controlled agricultural environments. We need the best scientific minds working on these problems. New technologies can help address some of these threats. Whole genome sequencing allows faster outbreak detection, and artificial intelligence more rapidly analyzes and identifies data trends that can produce safer food. The -the jack-in-the-box outbreak taught us that microbial surveillance is critical, that food safety threats evolve, and that food safety and public health depend on academia, industry, government, and consumer groups working together to address the food safety challenges of the future. It is an exciting time to be a food safety professional, and the IFT community has a myriad of experts to make our global food supply safer for everyone. I am truly excited to see what the future brings. Oh, wow. Me me too. This has been a great conversation, Emery, and thanks so much for taking a minute to chat with us today on Omnivore. Thank you, Julie. Anne-Marie McNamara is Vice President of Food Safety and Quality for Supply Chain, Manufacturing, and Commercialization at U.S. Foods, where she leads food safety and quality activities for an international supply chain of more than 1,800 private label co-packers and 17 manufacturing plants. In addition to her groundbreaking work at FSIS, McNamara has created and led food safety and risk assessment initiatives at Sara Lee, Maria Nutrisciences, Jack in the Box, and Target. McNamara's essay, The Crisis That Revolutionized Food Safety, appears in the April issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT First Annual Event and Expo. This year's event theme is Innovation in a Time of Crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Go to iftevent.org today. Join us and be part of the solution. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of IFT.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at IFT.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.